My name is Leander Williams. I'm from Oakland, California. Back in 1984, the most destructive change ever in my life took place. I became addicted to crack cocaine. When, where, and how, I don't really even remember. But I know that once I hit that pipe for the first time, that craving burned through my body like a phosphorus flare. It destroyed everything that it touched. It caused me to destroy everything that I touched. I stopped going to church. I stopped bringing money home to the family. I stopped interacting with my wife and my children. I started avoiding the Christians that I knew. All of the things that were important to me before I started fooling with crack cocaine suddenly had no meaning. In about a year and a half's time, I spent almost $70,000 on drugs. $70,000 that could have improved our family life, could have bought us a new home. But no, that crack cocaine had hold of me. It was like a leash around my neck. Wherever it went, I had to follow. I don't know how I made it home some nights. I really don't. I would wake up the next morning and I'd be sitting in my car in the driveway, never knowing how I got there. Sometimes I couldn't even remember where I'd been the night before. It had to be the love of God that brought me home, because it sure as heck wasn't me. It had to be his hands on the steering wheel because the car didn't have a tracking and homing device on there. It didn't know how to get home. It, the grace of God brought me home. One day I got up and I went into the bathroom and I looked into the mirror. The face that I saw there was not a face that I liked. I'd always been told that if you didn't like yourself, don't expect anyone else to. At that moment, I think I was lower than I'd ever been in my life. I did not like myself. I didn't like what I had done to the people that I loved. I didn't like what was going on in my life. I'd always been raised in the church. I'd always been an upstanding Christian. I may not have been perfect, but I always tried to live a good life. I always tried to consider the feelings of others. I always helped others first. What I had become, was a selfish monster. The only thing that mattered was me. Me, me, me. Everything had to be me or I. When I had money in my pocket, I spent it on me getting high. I didn't take money home and say, oh, here's some money, go pay this bill, or here's some money, go buy the kids something, or here's the money, go and get uh, some groceries. No, it was all about me and I. I turned into the most selfish person that you'd ever want to know because of that monster in my back, because of that flare in my belly that just destroyed everything that it touched. But when I looked into that mirror one morning and I saw that face looking back at me, I looked up towards heaven at that point. I said, God, I don't want this anymore. I didn't want to go to rehab because once the word got out that I was a crackhead, I'd lose the respect that I had. It's strange that when you're living so low, you worry about things like respect. I shouldn't have even, I had no need for respect at that point. All the people that I had hurt and I still worrying about them respecting me. But that's the way your mind operates when you're fogged with drugs. But I looked up towards God and I said, God, help me today. I want out of this. This is not me. I didn't hear him answer back. But I looked at the heavens again and I said, God, if my lips, if my hands ever touch enough, another crack pipe, you take me. You take me now, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing. I, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want my family to have to go through that again. Just take me on away and put me at the gates of hell where I belong. From that day forth, 
I'd never, I've never touched drugs again. This is 2004, and that was 1984. 20 years I've been clean. 20 years I have not had a desire for drugs. I pass drug dealers every day. Every day. Some of them drug dealers that I bought from 20 years ago. But they all know that I changed my life. When they see me coming, they say, how you doing? I say, great. They don't say, hey, you want to buy a rock? They respect what I've done with my life. I told God that I wanted to spread this word. I wanted to tell people about the destructiveness of drugs. But you know what? Those that are on drugs, they know it. They know what it does to you. They know how it feels to walk around in your house and looking down, looking at little specks on the floor, hoping that you see another rock somewhere that you dropped accidentally and get another momentary fix. They know how it is to steal from people that they love so that they could afford to get their next hit. Twenty dollars, ten dollars, five dollars, whatever they get in their pocket. It's not going to anything productive. It's going to that next hit. Because that is the ultimate goal of a crackhead. They don't worry about tomorrow. They worry about the next hit. I told God that I wanted to share my testimony with others. To show that you have to have rain in your life sometimes to even see the sunshine. My life was so low that I had nowhere else to go but up. Friends, if you've been in that situation and you had to go to rehab, you had to take the 12-step program, take advantage of it. Everybody is not as strong as I am that was able to just do it cold turkey. I had God on my side because I called on the name of Jesus. And he heard my cry. If you have to do whatever it takes to get off of it, get off of it. Trust me, it's only going to destroy you in the end. Everything that you hold dear in life won't mean a thing when you started fooling around with crack. Now they have all these other drugs, ecstasy, date rape drugs. Friends, Satan is always on his job. We let him take us places that we don't want to go. We let him direct our lives down the wrong road. We need God in our lives. God won't let you go wrong. We often walk away from him, but he'll never walk away from us. It's the love of God, my friends, that brought me through that dark period in my life it made me realize that there are always situations that could be worse than what you're in I thank God today that he delivered me from that life of drugs I don't have any type of craving for drugs now I could sit right here right now and have the biggest rock in the world sitting in front of me and it wouldn't impress me. I challenged myself when I got off of drugs. I bought a rock and I put it on my mantelpiece in a place where the kids of course couldn't see it or know what it was. They were young then. But I put that rock there and that rock was my temptation. You know, the Bible says, yield not to temptation. I'm thankful, my friends, that I did not yield. I looked at that rock every day when I came home, and I said, devil, you think I'm going to smoke you, don't you? It's not going to happen. I kept that rock there for almost a year. One day I said, you know what? I don't need this temptation anymore. 
I took that rock and flushed it down the toilet. And I hoped that none of the fish in the bay got sick. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this in closing. Whatever it is in your life that has you down, call on the name of Jesus. It's the only name that I know that will give you peace in a time of storm. It's the only name I know that will calm your fears when you're having to deal with the unknown. My brothers and sisters, call that name. Call it often. You can never call it enough. And remember, if you want deliverance, go to St. Matthew 6, chapter 9 through 13, verse, and pray the universal prayer. Bow our heads for a moment as I pray it with you. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters, and have a blessed day. I'd like you to get your pen and pencil and papers together here and jot down some scriptures. I want you to follow with me and I want you to get your Bibles out. My key verse will be Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the 31st verse. I'll also be speaking from John, the 3rd chapter, the 4th and 5th verse. Ephesians, the 4th chapter, the 23rd through the 32nd verse. And finally... Ecclesiastes, the 7th chapter, the 19th and 20th verse. For a text topic today, I'd like to say, reboot our lives. Reboot our lives. Now, if you want to relay it to yourself, then say, reboot your life. And reflecting back over my life, it has become apparent that many of us has become dependent on computers for everything we do in our daily lives. Those that have computers, we get up in the morning and we rush to our computer. We want to check our email, our stocks and bonds. We want to see who's online. We want to chat with our buddies. It's so now that we'll chat on the computer before we chat on the phone. Computers perform all the tasks that used to be done by manual input. At the supermarket, computerized scanners track what you purchase. The clerks no longer have to know how much each item costs. As long as they know where that barcode is and scan it through, the computer will tell you how much it costs. At the gas station, computers tell the gas pump how much to pump, when to start and stop. Even when you go to the bank now, in the old days you used to be able to bring in your passbook and they'd just write down your deposit in your passbook, give it back to you and you knew how much you had. Now they ask you for your account number. They punch it in the computer and they can tell you how much money you have. We do so much and we have so much dependency on computers. We can buy whatever we want now without going out of our house. We can buy online. We can go in and we can pay bills online. We can uh, make investments online. What happens when that online world crashes? Everything comes to a screeching halt. And something as simple as a power outage, businesses have to shut down. Because without their power and their computer systems, they can't continue to do their business. And if they call the power company and the power company says they're going to be out for four or five hours, they start sending employees home. It's not cost effective for a company to have people sitting around on the clock and not being able to work. But what happens when our lives break down? We can't simply shut down until the situation gets better and the problem that caused the breakdown in the first place has vanished. There are those of us who have taken the drastic approach of suicide to avoid having to cope with their problems. But we all know that in the Bible, suicide is the one unforgivable sin. So how do those of us who choose to stay and deal with adversity succeed in the end? Let's talk about computers and what happens when there are problems that cause them to malfunction. 
How many of you have been merrily typing along and all of a sudden you get a blue screen and some message that might say, there has been a page fault error at blah, 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 press control alt delete to restart your computer. Or perhaps you get a message that says this operation has performed an illegal function and will be shut down. You will need to restart your computer. When that happens, sometimes even control alt and delete won't help. Your computer will freeze and the only solution is to shut it off and then restart it. The common term is rebooting the computer. Pressing Control alt delete does what's called a warm reboot. The reason for that is because the computer is not totally powered down. But when that doesn't work, you either have to shut it off or unplug it and then start it over from scratch. That's called a cold reboot. Now when we face adversity or problems in our lives, we can't do Control alt delete and restart from that moment. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that? Press delete and just erase everything bad? What about if we had a backspace bar and we saw ourselves in a situation that we couldn't figure out how to get out of? How come we just hit backspace and back up a few feet and then go around the side of it and not have to deal with it? Kind of impossible, would we think? What we can do as Christians, however, at any given moment in our lives is to go inside our souls Discover where our weaknesses are, and then reboot our lives. Let me call your attention to Isaiah 40th chapter and 31st verse. It's where I get this reboot your life from. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. The theory behind rebooting your computer is that when you do, you get rid of the problems. And when it comes back, it's working fine. It's working better now. Why isn't that the thing we expect when we reboot our lives? When we come back, we're stronger Christians. When times go hard and problems seem to press us from all directions, we need to remember that it was faith that has brought us this far, and it should be faith to carry us forth. We are much more efficient than computers because we have the power to think independently of programs. A computer can only function as it has been programmed by its designers and program writers. A computer that is programmed to give you the coffee price in China cannot tell you how much a plane ticket from Chicago to San Francisco is. But a human being can find anything out. A Christian has the capability to adapt to any situation, whether scripted or not. Our training from the time we discovered Christ is that of resisting Satan, trying to live a holy and sanctified life. We are programmed by the teachings that we have to fall on our knees and pray when times get hard and to give our problems over to the Lord in prayer. So how do we reboot our lives, you ask? It's simple, eh? Actually, in John, the third chapter, the fourth and fifth verse, Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Baptism is rebirth. Acceptance of the Holy Spirit is rebirth. Believing in the name of Jesus is rebirth. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is rebooting. Because when we die the first death and we're resurrected, we're rebooted. Rebooting is rebirth. How many of us hear older people say, it's too late for me. I'm too old to try to get saved now. Friends, it is never, ever too late to give your life over to the Lord. We all know the story of Saul. Saul was one of the biggest cut-ups in the Bible. He persecuted the church, murdered everything that believed again in the church. You know what? He had no desire to do anything good. 
And one day he was on his way to Damascus. And Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, confronted him. At that moment, Saul had no further choice in what he did. He was converted, and he was made to be a new person. Paul became rebooted. When he rebooted his life, and he emerged as Paul from Saul, we knew, based on the teachings and the readings in the Bible, that he became one of the strongest and most powerful teachers in the Bible. Paul did more teaching from prison than he had while he was a free man. He taught those churches how they ought to have behaved and how to be good Christian churches. We should use Paul as an example because if you look at him and you look at where he came from, from the life of Saul, the persecutor, we should know that if he could have his life rebooted, so can we. Now what happens when our lives get rebooted? Well, let me direct you this to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 23rd through the 31st, I'm sorry, 32nd verse where it reads, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth when he talks to his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather him, let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may be ministered grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sakes, has forgiven you. Think of what that just said. We talk about rebooting our lives. And what's the first thing it said? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man. You have been rebooted, Christians. Get rid of all of your lying. Talk the truth to your neighbors. The Bible says you can get angry, but avoid that sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't go to bed at night mad with anybody. Don't let your neighbor talk about you and you talk back about him try to compromise neither give place to the devil lord have mercy if we give the devil an inch he wants a mile you let him ride with you he gonna want to drive let the thief stop stealing let him go out and do an honest day's work for a change it says let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth Stop lying. Stop backbiting. Stop talking about your neighbor. Stop talking about your sisters and brothers. Stop talking about people you don't even know. It says, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace upon the hearers. If you can't say something good about somebody, avoid saying anything about them. Don't let people hear you gossiping. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Don't be sad that Jesus died. Jesus died to give us a chance for eternal life. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. This is saying the same thing it said earlier. Get rid of all of that bitterness. Stop talking about people. Get rid of that hate and anger. Stop talking evil about people. Get rid of it all. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Forgiveness is one thing that the society that we live in 
is slow to do. We have such a problem with forgiveness. People think that, uh, why should I forgive him? Hell, he screwed over me. The Bible is just right. If it ain't fitting to be in the Bible, it was not written. If we can take these words and incorporate them into our everyday lives, we will have made a successful reboot. God never said it would be easy to follow him. He often puts challenges in our way, submits us to tests of our faith to see how we're going to react. Are we going to run? Are we going to hide? Are we going to put our head in the sand? Or are we going to drop on our knees and pray and say, Lord, help me through this? The life that we live from this moment forth is what determines our course of action and whether we are on the right road to get to the kingdom of God. Are we content that the life we live right now is sufficient in the eyesight of God? Remember, he says all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do we accept that none of us is perfect and that we should strive each day to live better than we did the day before? A good person learns from his mistakes or her mistakes and from the realization that none of us are perfect. One who thinks as such is only disillusioned and will never amount to anything successful. In my closing, I say this from Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter, the 19th and 20th verse. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than the ten mighty men which are in the city, for there is not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Remember that we are not perfect, so let's don't try to display a holier-than-thou attitude towards our fellow man. We all are children of God. We all were created equal in his God's name, in his eyesight. The next time your computer crashes and you have to reboot it, remember, from time to time, we need to reboot our lives also. When we reboot our lives, we will grow stronger in the Lord. God bless you, and I hope you got a thought from this text today.